Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for um, for the generous welcome this morning, and and also for taking a little bit of time to uh, to hear my thoughts on on what I'm calling the connected future of banking. Um, uh, we've only got 20 minutes, so let me dive straight into it. Um, but one of the things that we do know is that uh, banking uh, and financial services have very much been a changing space, um, and certainly over the course of the the the, the last year in 2020. Um, the rate of change inside uh, the use of digital channels in banking um, has accelerated. Um, certainly, we at HSBC have seen a very rapid uh, uptick in um, the use of our digital channels. Um, they were already very high, but that sort of last segment of the um, of the banking population that were not using our digital channels have come to us uh, in, in great uh, in great pace. Um, but of course, the journey doesn't stop there. And uh, we very much see that we're at the cusp of, or in the early stages of, the next um, uh, phase of, of banking and financial services through digital channels. And it started back about 25 odd years ago with internet banking. Uh, and then as the mobile devices and the speed of the mobile networks um, matured over the last decade or so, we've seen very much a shift to mobile banking. Um, but now here in 2020, um, we're going to that next generation. And that's really about creating a connected environment of, uh, of, uh, of uh, banking and financial services and powered through uh, API connections. Um, what's going to define success in this um, uh, next era of connected banking is really going to be, I guess, the ability of financial services organisations to make their services and data available to, um, to uh, customers and partner organisations um, through a range of different mechanisms. We're either going to uh, participate in open banking initiatives, and of course HSBC is very much uh, actively involved in a, uh, open banking in the markets where that legislation has been passed. Um, we're actively um, connecting with the open, uh, sorry, the external API economy um, through, uh, through marketplaces and the like. Um, and we're using what we call industrial APIs for, uh, for deep customer integration and to embed banking into customer value chains. And that's really where we'll go to a large customer and we'll build um, custom built APIs that allow us to connect our banking systems to their ERP or to their trade systems or, or whatever. But when you think about banking and APIs, APIs really are just a tool. Um, what this is really all about is ecosystems. And Ecosystems, I think, is a really important way of, of thinking about, um, about banking and financial services. Uh, that photo there is actually a, a photo I took of a place called Kakadu in the north of, uh, of Australia, where I'm from. Um, and uh, Kakadu National Park is one of the most beautiful and sophisticated natural ecosystems that we, uh, that we, that we enjoy in Australia. Um, the thing that's uh, important about any ecosystem, and certainly important, important about uh, the Kakadu one, is the way that all the different participants all work together, doing their own job, doing their own thing to make this ecosystem work in a way that is effective for everybody. Um, you know, the, the grass that grows in the water provides uh, uh, filtration and, and oxygen for the fish and the fish are food for the birds and the birds are food for the crocodiles and, and so on. But each player in that ecosystem works together in a way that creates a symbiotic system that brings value and benefit to, uh, to all the participants of that ecosystem. But what's a business ecosystem? Um, this is something that I personally have a great interest in. And, and um, I found this wonderful diagram from a company called Wavestone in the United States, where they talk about um, an ecosystem is a connected environment that provides value across a business value chain. Um, and in any ecosystem, um, we use technology, um, API technology, to, in a business ecosystem, to be able to create connection and interoperability um, or orchestration. Orchestration that allows us to um, uh, share data, share services, to, to construct new um, value, uh, technology enabled value streams that allow us to um, execute on business or, or execute on transactions in a way that was previously either very manual. Um, or that it required uh, exchange of data and currency and value between hard boundaries between organisations to moving to a model where everybody is really interconnected and able to um, participate freely and move data and transactions and services freely inside the ecosystem. Um, in an industry model, these ecosystems will um, expand beyond the, the model that's talked about here 
to also include complementary organisations and partners and others, but the whole principle remains the same. If you provide uh, a structured environment, an orchestrated environment, where all of the participants are able to perform their functions, to be able to add their value to the ecosystem, then you have an opportunity to build a sustainable and viable value-added ecosystem for, uh, for uh, the participants. Um, value-added ecosystems or sustainable ecosystems um, are very hard things to make. Um, you know, the, the history of the internet is littered with lots of companies or organisations that tried very hard to, uh, to create sustainable ecosystems that weren't quite able to get there. And in my own study of ecosystems over the last 20 odd years, um, I've really bro broken it down to four things that, um, uh, that uh, define um, a, a, a sustainable ecosystem in their own right. The very early ecosystems, when the internet first, um, first started and tra transactions and commerce were hard, were really built around community and markets. Um, in the, I remember, um, oh gosh, about 20 odd years ago, uh, discovering this wonderful thing in the United States called Etsy. And Etsy was this community of creators, um, people who create art or, um, or um, uh, you know, home crafts and things like that. Um, and it created, the, the thing about this community was that it did a couple of things. It was one created an opportunity for people with like interests to get together and meet. So if you were into macrame, you were able to get into Etsy and meet other macrame makers and become part of that community. Um, it created a platform where people could sell their wares and then ultimately it became a platform where people could buy all the things they needed to be able to do their creation and to do their craft. Um, and that thing has grown into um, a, quite a sustainable ecosystem. It's a publicly listed company now. Um, it has uh, hundreds of, uh, well, it has millions of, uh, of creators who go on there and, um, and, and make and create and supply um, their services into uh, in that community, and um, and it's become quite a vibrant uh, vibrant sort of a place. The second driver of creation of community is one of functionality, and it's where technology capability serves as a base of uh, creation of an ecosystem, or provides the tools to allow connection within the ecosystem. So, what does that mean? Um, we see this in sort of business supply chains or business value chains. Um, for example, um, you've got companies like Gusto in the United States, which is an HR management platform. And what Gusto does is that it um, brings together all the different services that you need to be able to provide employment administration and HR administration for companies of all sizes. And that's pretty relevant in a market like the United States because the local requirements for reporting and tax and insurance and benefits and things like that vary from state to state and in some cases from city to city. And so, uh, for a small business who might be trying to work across multiple locations or even start up in their home city, um, having a platform that brings together all the different services providers to provide an end-to-end -end journey is highly valuable. And when the companies that do this get this right, um, you see that they grow momentum and they grow very quickly and they start to sort of get to that, that um, uh, point of natural sustenance where they continue to grow and they continue to get bigger and they continue to bring more uh, more um, customers on. The third type of, uh, of economy of, the, of uh, ecosystems are the ones that get there by scale and reach. And these are the big ones that we all know. Um, the likes of Amazon and Alibaba, Uber, Tencent, Ping An, they're all massive platforms with hundreds of millions of, of uh, users, all per performing their various roles inside their ecosystem. You know, in, in Amazon, there's uh, an ecosystem of suppliers and then a sellers, sorry, and beneath them an ecosystem of suppliers and manufacturers. There is an ecosystem of customers. There's a whole industry of people who help people build stores, run stores, uh, and so on. But it's all enabled by this massive platform um, of technology that brings the base functionality and the data and resources to be able to, uh, to build that sustainable ecosystem. Um, the last characteristic is trust. And the, and the ecosystems of trust are something that I think were the last um, uh, type of ecosystem that we're really starting to, uh, to grow inside, uh, inside this online economy. Um, and the trust thing is really important because as, as people and organisations start to move more of their business and more of their day-to-day -day activities into an online environment, um, the, I guess the relative risk of the transactions or the relative impact of transactions gone wrong um, goes up. Um, you know, if you're a, a, an organisation that has a retail outlet in a physical environment, 
Um, if you're only doing 10% of your business online, then you know if you get 5% of your customers or 5% of your transactions are bad, then it's not so much of, a, of an issue. But if all of a sudden 80% of your business is online and 5% of your, uh, your transactions are, are bad or fraudulent or, uh, or, or the likes, then that suddenly becomes a pretty material issue and you start to have to, uh, uh, have to think about trust and, um, and proof of identity and, and things like that in a different way. And so what we're finding is, is that um, ecosystems are starting to emerge that are combining um, uh, an element of trust. So there are organisations that traditionally have been custodians of trust largely um, banks, financial institutions, um, uh, certain um, um, organisations, large universities, that can sometimes be custodians of trust. And in some cases, those, uh, those trust custodians are working with um, functional or, uh, or, or ecosystems that have come out of the, the three other types to build their own ecosystem. Now, in banking and financial services, one of the big things that we have, a, have as a core attribute is this element of trust. Um, you know, people rely on us um, and we're a regulated business that gives a mechanism and a structure to, uh, to ensure that that trust is, uh, is enabled and, and respected. Um, they rely on us to, uh, to provide um, trust and surety that their money will be safe and that, um, and that they, they'll be able to uh, transact in a way that, um, that, that is uh, reliable and, and, and lower in risk. And so a great opportunity for, for financial services organisations and for banks in the future is participation in these ecosystems as a custodian of trust. We also have, of course, the fact that we provide functionality and we provide scale and reach. Um, you know, delivering financial services payments around the world every single day across, well, HSBC does it across 60 countries, um, is, not, is not a trivial thing. Um, the volumes of transactions are in the trillions um, and the values of, uh, of transactions are equally high numbers. And so um, there, are th there are natural positions, I guess, that, uh, that organisations uh, like financial services organisations and banks can take as we move more and more into this connected ecosystem environment. I guess in, in order to understand where you're going to fit um, in an ecosystem environment is one of, one of the key decisions that you have to make. One of my observations over having worked in the internet for a long time, I started my personal internet company in 1993 and so even though I don't look that old, I've been doing this for a long time. Um, one of my observations is, is that I've seen a lot of investments or companies um, fail when they go and try and pursue an ecosystem strategy that that isn't where they naturally fit. Um, you know, there's a whole uh, raft of organisations that have tried to disrupt traditional industries and value chains. Um, and on trying to enter and disrupt those traditional value chains, they've found that there's more than just the technology and more than just the data that enables those, those ecosystems to, uh, to, to work. And so a real challenge for any financial services organisation is to understand your natural fit in any ecosystem and where you are, um, are, going to, uh, are going to be able to naturally uh, land and thrive. This is a great model that was developed by uh, a person called Kristen Moyer from Gartner. And it's a little bit old, it's 2017, which is what, 100 internet years. Um, but, uh, but I think it's a really wonderful way to, to depict um, how to evaluate where your natural fit is. If you're in an environment where you have a very high risk appetite and you have a, 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 the ability to lead the industry direction, then you absolutely should try and build something. And we've got a great example in, in Hong Kong where uh, HSBC has built PayMe, which uh, is very much a, about building an ecosystem for person-to-person -person and, and person-to-business payments. Um, uh, conversely, if you have a very low um, level of uh, risk appetite, and you don't really have control, then, then you really need to focus your energies on adapting to an industry direction. And, and the, the best way to do that is to either collaborate um, with, uh, with the strong players in any ecosystem market or, uh, or to partner um, if, uh, if you um, feel like uh, your risk appetite is a little bit higher. Um, and then, of course, if you've got a low level of risk appetite and you, you want to lead the industry direction, then you need to buy somebody who's already strong in that, uh, in that environment. Um, but the important thing is, is that <coughs> your position is sustainable when it's natural. So, for example, um, HSBC has a very strong business in trade finance. It's very natural for us to be um, a very active in industry-leading uh, initiatives around trade and trade finance. 
Um, conversely, uh, it might be that um, it, there are other ecosystems where we don't necessarily have a strong natural position, and maybe our best strategy is to um, is to uh, um, uh, to partner or collaborate. And so, one of my um, constant messages is really to make sure that uh, as you evaluate ecosystems that you wish to uh, to work with, that you do it in a way that you are um, uh, identifying a sustainable place of natural fit and then working with the right partners and, uh, and, um, um, and, and participants to be able to do that. Now, the important thing in all of this and bringing it back to our topic of APIs is that this is only made possible through interconnectivity of systems and data and the, our ability to, to provide frictionless flow of transactions and data between ourselves and our partners and, and ecosystem participants. Ecosystem, the future of connected banking is ecosystems, but the engine of ecosystems is APIs. So as my thoughts on the connected future of banking, I sit here very excited about the future that we have ahead of us. I think, you know, it's the, the changing nature of markets, the changing nature of, of our customer expectations, um, the learning that we get when we see um, a high performing startup or a fintech that solves a problem for our customers in a new way that helps to educate our service proposition for uh, for our, our valuable customers. Um, it all, it's all about creating uh, a, a higher value experience for our customers and it's all made a, 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 a possible through APIs and technologies that, uh, that, that empower it. So in closing, um, my top tips. Um, number one is just to accept that the future of banking is connected. Um, if you're going to make it, well, not going to, when you have to make your decision about, um, about uh, entering into ecosystems, to ensure that you participate in the API and power economy and that you're providing the right services um, and, uh, and products to add value to the ecosystem to, to help every, every organization in the ecosystem thrive. Um, the very first question that you need to, um, to ask is, is my position in this ecosystem natural? And understand that your position in, in different types of ecosystems will be different. So you need to ask that question every single time. The second thing is, is that once, you, once you've understood where your position is, be really clear on what the, you're there to do. Um, you can't be in an ecosystem and be everything. By definition, you can't. It's not the way that ecosystems work. So you need to make sure that your proposition is clear and that you are performing to your proposition and fulfilling the job that you are there to do. In my Kakadu National Park example, the plants filter the water and provide food for a whole pile of, uh, of uh, other ecosystem participants. There's nothing else that they can do to add value, and so they're best focused on doing that job particularly well. Well, ecosystem participants should be focusing on, on, uh, on that exact point themselves. Um, use the ecosystem as an opportunity to learn. Deliver the products and services that are supported that are based on your strengths, and then learn and evolve and modify those existing products and services to fit or indeed create new products or services to fit that are, um, that are based on the, the things that, that are aligned to your natural position. A big one is make friends. Um, sometimes the most powerful place in an ecosystem is as a critical value adder in somebody else's ecosystem. And certainly we're seeing as, as connected marketplaces and ecosystems grow that there are some places where the very best thing we can do as HSBC is to be a strong value adding partner for the ecosystem that is already succeeding uh, in, its, in its own domain. Um, be critical of the risks and opportunities. Um, sometimes you, you need to make decisions. You need to make decisions about whether or not you're going to disintermediate yourself in, in a particular type of market or ecosystem, uh, and you need to decide whether or not that's okay. You need to understand whether or not the risk profile of the type of commerce that happens in that ecosystem is something that you're happy to have your brand and reputation aligned to. You need to make sure that, um, that you're covering the, the inherent risks that are there with uh, the transmission of data and, and cyber security and all those sorts of things. Um, and so you need to make sure you have the right balance. You know, it's everything in business, there's opportunities and upside, but there's also constraints and risks that you need to be aware of. And then my last comment is just do it. Move, learn, iterate and grow. Um, APIs are exciting. They're very powerful technologies that enable us to um, to uh, think about new ways to serve customers, think away new ways to reach markets, think about new products and services to add value. 
Um, but we're not going to, to, uh, to do that if we just sit there with a whiteboard and talk about it. It's time to get out there and take some action. And so with that, I'm happy to take any questions or take any comments or... Yep. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Richard. So uh, one question. Uh, so um, as you have men mentioned that um, in the future, BIT is talking about connected business. So uh, this is also my experience that uh, when we need to integrate... Uh, we can't hear you. Can't hear you, Patrick. Oh, can, you can't hear me. Can you hear me? Hello. Is it? Can 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 hear me? No. Hello, hello, hello. Okay. So can can hear me? Is it? Can you hear me? Cannot. Cannot. So maybe I, I go I go there. <laughs> okay. So Okay, interesting. So okay. So uh, Richard, sorry that I actually like I, I'm in the next room uh, of Richard. So I have to ask the question here. Yes. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um so uh, uh you talk about uh, the future is connected business, but uh, now there's so many different kind of ecosystem. Uh, how as a bank, how can you integrate with different kind of ecosystem because they will have their own standard, etc. Whether how how the bank can keep your own control, etc. Uh, et so one of one of the things that we can do, I guess, is um, we develop to our own standards, um, and uh, and some of those standards are defined by industry standards, ISO standards, and things like that. But also. Um, I think a big part of it is about making our APIs and our API infrastructure understandable and accessible to our partners. Um, and uh, building a strong developer community and engaging with that developer community is really a big part of that. Um, uh, and also it's uh, about taking feedback. Um, you know, the, one of the things that I, I always get excited about dealing with, um, with the uh, startup uh, ecosystems uh, and, and, uh, and the smart new fintechs and things is the creativity and the problem solving that these people bring. And so I enjoy listening to their approach to a different problem and that informs how we design and, and evolve the API infrastructure that we have. Um, one, of my, one of my call outs to, uh, to, to friends and colleagues who are listening to this presentation today is get involved. Get involved in the ecosystems, let us know what's going to work let us know if, if we do something that makes uh, what you're trying to do hard. Give us that feedback. You know, we're all about building that interoperability and building that uh, building that connectivity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, thanks, Richard, for your time. So yeah, although we have some technical issues, but hopefully yeah, we got there. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> hopefully everyone can really uh, understand and also can catch up the uh, Richard's content. So thanks again for Richard's time. Yes, and uh, and, and reach out. Um, I'm on all, all the well. I'm on uh, on. Uh, uh, LinkedIn and uh, and Twitter. If you have a question, feel free to message me or uh, or, uh, or reach out some other way. And I'm more than happy to get in, into the conversation. But but um, be brave, right? Like it's exciting times, and and there's real opportunity for the for the smart people who, um, who as I say, move, evolve, learn, and grow. Yeah. Congratulations, uh, Patrick, on a wonderful event. Yeah, thanks, thanks. And I would also say that uh, Richard is a really nice guy. I sent an email <laughs> to him and then to invite him, and he immediately accepted to, to help the UN. So feel free to wish him out. So Thank thanks again. Thank you very much.